Unlike the previous video where I focused mostly on the chessboard itself, in this video we're going to look at one specific chess piece, the knight. In case you're unaware, the knight is a chess piece that moves in sort of an L shape. It can either move two squares vertically and one horizontally, or two horizontally and one vertically. And you might think that's kind of a strange way for a piece to move, and frankly it is, but the fact that it's kind of strange makes for some pretty interesting problems. The first one I want to look at is one of the first recreational chess puzzles ever published. It dates back to 1512, and an Italian guy named Paolo Guarini. The idea is to trade our standard 8x8 chessboard for a 3x3 chessboard, and put two black knights on the bottom two corners, and two white knights on the top two corners. The challenge of the puzzle is to play as both sides, black and white, and to swap the positions of the black and white pieces in as few moves as possible. Can you do it? It's actually a fun little puzzle, and might be worth pausing the video and trying it out on your own. After a few minutes, you can probably just trial and error your way through it, but it might be more satisfying to have a more concrete solution. Let's first consider the knight in the bottom left. There's only two different squares that he could move to. We'll need to take advantage of both of those squares. One of them is where the black knight will move. The other one is where the white knight will come from just before it ends up in its final spot. We don't know which is which at this point, so let's just take them one at a time. Hypothetically, a knight ending up at this spot only has two options on where it can move. One path is already depicted, so let's add the other path and consider the possible moves of a knight that takes that path. Again, we see only two options. One's already shown, let's add the other one. As we continue to work our way around the board, we see that every square that we end up on only has two possible moves, one already pictured and one new one that we add. We continue to do so until we get all the way back to where we started. Okay, we got a cool little star drawn on our chessboard, but what does this even tell us? Well, look what happens when we break the board apart a little bit and then move the pieces around to make the pass a little bit easier to see. All of a sudden, the solution is super obvious. The only ways to swap the pieces is to either move everything clockwise or counterclockwise. And whichever way we choose, each piece will need four moves. So four times four, we need 16 total moves. To make sure we didn't miss anything, we could label each of the different squares and then keep track of where each of the four different knights move. Now we could return all the squares to their original configuration and test out the sequence of moves to make sure that it does in fact switch the position of the black and white knights. Sure enough, we've swapped the positions of the knights and done so in as few moves as possible, so we've solved Guarini's problem. A fun extension to this problem is if you have a 4x3 chessboard and three black knights at the bottom and three white knights up top. It ends up being a little bit more fun if you don't have to alternate between black and white turns. So let's remove that caveat. See if you can swap the positions of the black and white knights and do so in 16 moves. I'll show a solution at the end of the video. However, I don't want to spend any more time on knight swapping because there's a related problem that I want to get into. You may have noticed when we were mapping out the moves that turned into the star that a given knight can traverse around the board pretty well. In fact, our star shows that a given knight can start on any square other than the middle square, visit every other square other than the middle square exactly one time, and return to the square at which they started. That's kind of cool. The only thing that would make it better would be if the knight were able to touch every square exactly once and return to where they started. Doing so is what's called a closed tour of the chessboard. It's pretty easy to see that one is not possible in our 3x3 chessboard because a knight can never get to that center square. But you might wonder if one is possible on an 8x8 chessboard. Turns out it is. One of the people to look into this problem is my favorite mathematician of all time, Leonard Euler, and he came up with this pretty cool solution for a closed tour of the 8x8 chessboard. What Euler did was find an open tour of the bottom four rows of the chessboard, meaning the knight visits every square in the bottom half of the chessboard, but doesn't end up where he starts. However, he does end up in a spot that allows him to take advantage of some symmetry. When the knight first jumps to the top half of the chessboard, it's in the spot where the starting point would be if the chessboard were rotated 180 degrees about its center. What that means is the knight can repeat the exact same pattern he did on the bottom half of the chessboard up on the top half, and it'll end up at the same spot where it ended at the bottom half, again if we rotate 180 degrees. The nice thing about this spot is it's just one move away from the starting point, which gives us our closed tour. Essentially, Euler found two different open tours that connected just right to create a closed tour. I think that's kind of cool. So anyway, we've seen a closed tour on an 8x8 chessboard, and we've seen that no such tour is possible on a 3x3 chessboard, but what about the infinitely many other chessboards out there? I mean, surely there's no way we could categorize all of them as either having or not having a closed tour. Is there? Heck yeah, there is. 
This dude, Alan Schwenk, was able to do that. And his methods were kind of cool, simple enough that I can describe them in this video. Let's start out with the chess boards for which a closed tour is not possible. If one of the two dimensions is the number one, then clearly we're not gonna have a closed tour, right? I mean, picture a one by five chess board. Doesn't matter where you start, the knight can't go anywhere. So we certainly can't visit all of the different squares. It's impossible. I might argue that in a one by one chess board, a closed tour is sort of vacuously possible. But typically one by one isn't even viewed as a chess board, which I guess makes sense. So for simplicity, we'll just say if one of the dimensions is one, there's no closed tour. Similarly, if one of the dimensions is two, we're gonna get in trouble. This is another statement that I'm gonna kind of leave without an argument. I mean, just sort of think about it. You got a, I don't know, two by eight chessboard. Start your knight wherever he wants. If he goes right on his first move, he can never come back left. If he goes left on his first move, he can never come back right. We're not gonna be able to make a closed tour if one of the dimensions is two. We'll return to the case where the length or width is equal to three shortly. But first I wanna consider the case where either length or width is equal to four. This case is kind of tricky, so much so that I'm gonna need some extra room. To illustrate the point, I'll start with the four by eight chessboard, but hopefully my argument will convince you that the eight is irrelevant and this holds any time the length or width is equal to four. Before I get into my argument, I wanna change the coloring on the chessboard a little bit. Why? Don't worry about that. It's my chessboard, I'll color it however I want. Anyways, what I want you to do is imagine that we have a closed tour on this chessboard. Maybe kind of visualize in your head all the little lines that I've been putting in in red, going through every square on our chessboard exactly once and ending where they start. We got this big old crisscrossing loop of red lines on this beautiful four-color chessboard. At some point, we visit this purple square in the top left-hand corner. Note that there's only two ways to get there from one of these two blue squares. And if we're standing on this purple square, our only options are to travel to one of these two blue squares. And furthermore, that's not specific to this top left-hand corner purple square. That's true of all of our purple squares. The only way to get there is from a blue square, and the only place to go once we're there is to a blue square. If I were untangling these hypothetical red lines that you're picturing in your head, showing our closed tour of this chessboard, kind of like I did in the three by three case earlier in this video, but don't want to do in this case because it would be an animation nightmare, we'd see this huge loop and directly left and right of every single purple square, we'd see a blue square. Uh, all right, I guess I'm following so far. Okay, if you believe that, we got a problem. Because look, there's the exact same number of purple and blue squares. So if we're gonna have a blue square on either side of any purple square, we also have to have a purple square on either side of any blue square, or we're gonna run out of blue squares before we get all the purple squares. The point is, the fact that we can only get to and from a purple square via a blue square means that our closed loop can't contain anything except for purple and blue squares, so it can't possibly contain all squares, so it's not a closed tour to begin with. Maybe it's easier to think about it like this. Because a closed loop visits every square on the chessboard exactly once and ends up where it starts, we can think of our closed loop as starting on whatever square we want. So let's think of it as starting up here in the top left. At this point, our closed loop still has to visit all eight of the blue squares, and it also has to visit the remaining seven purple squares and get back to this purple square. So really, it has to visit eight more purple squares. As we saw before, from this square, the knight absolutely must go to a blue square. That much is obvious. However, from this blue square is where things get interesting. I claim that any time a knight is on a blue square, it must immediately go straight back to a purple square. To prove this is the case, suppose that it doesn't. Suppose it hops, I don't know, down here to this green square maybe. Well now look at the squares we still have left to visit. We still have to visit all eight purple squares, the seven we haven't yet visited, and the one we started on because we have to end up wherever we started, but we only have seven blue squares left to visit. The only path to any of these eight purple squares is via a blue square, but there's only seven blue squares to get there. We can't possibly visit all eight purple squares. What went wrong? We didn't just alternate purple and blue squares the whole way through. Okay, just do that. I can't do that, because if I do that, I don't have a closed loop because I don't visit any of the green squares, nor the yellow squares for that matter. This coloring argument proves that it's impossible for a knight to have a closed tour of a chessboard where one of the dimensions is four. Okay, so we've eliminated one, two, and four as a possible dimension. You started talking about three, but didn't quite finish. What else is there to talk about? Well, the last major hurdle that we have to clear before we can revisit the case where one of the dimensions is three is when both of the dimensions are odd numbers. So a five by seven chessboard, for example. To see that this is problematic, just note that the number of squares on a chessboard is the product of its length and width. And the product of any two odd numbers is an odd number. And because moving a knight always changes the color of the square that it's on, because moving two squares in any direction keeps the color the same, and moving one square in any direction changes the color, a closed tour can only happen on a chessboard with an even number of squares. Think about if you were numbering the squares. The starting square is numbered with a one, the next square you visit a two, then a three, and so on. 
And because every move changes the color of the square you're on, the colors of all the odd numbered squares will be the same as the color of the starting square. Now think about the very last square that you visit before you return to the starting square. Because we're moving from it to the starting square, and every move changes the color, the last square must be the opposite color as the first square. So in this case, the last square must be yellow. But only the even numbered squares are yellow. So the last square, which corresponds with the number of squares on the chessboard, must be odd, which means it's not yellow. We have a contradiction. This coloring argument shows if we have an odd number of squares on our chessboard, which happens if and only if both the length and the width are odd numbers, then our knight can't possibly complete a closed tour on that chessboard. You may be running out of patience, so let me give you the punchline. Our list of chessboards that don't have a closed knight's tour is complete. For all of the infinitely many remaining chessboards out there, we can come up with a closed knight's tour. That's pretty amazing. Knowing what I know about graph theory, I totally expected this to be the kind of problem where we knew some specific chessboards where you could find a closed tour, and we were able to rule out some specific chessboards as not possibly containing a closed tour, but I expected there to be tons of chessboards where we just had no idea. The number of possible paths just grows too big too quick, not even computers can figure it out. That's what I was expecting. Boy was I wrong. Anything not falling under the five points listed in our no column is a yes. If you've been paying attention, you might be like, wait, your no column's all messed up. You never even finished point three. Okay, that's fair. I want to save point three for the end. Anyways, without further ado, point three is much easier to say than it is to prove. The idea that it's meant to capture is that if one of the dimensions is three and the other one is either six or eight, then we can't have a closed tour. That's it. Sounds simple enough, right? Two very specific chessboards that can't exist. Show why they can't exist and we can move on. Let's start with a three by six chessboard. Consider a knight on this square. There's only two squares it can reach. So if we have a closed tour, the knight gets to this square from one of these two, and then travels to the other one. Now consider a knight on this square. Again, we see only two squares it can move to. The exact same two squares we saw before. In order to visit these two purple squares, we must use all four of these depicted paths. But as you can see, these four paths form a loop, which makes it impossible for the knight to ever visit the remaining squares. If we had a closed tour, these four edges would have to be in it, and these four edges can't be in a closed tour. So there's no possible way to have a closed tour on this 3x6 chessboard. What about a 3x8 chessboard? Okay, prepare yourself, this gets a little intense. Just like we did in the 3x6 case, we want to look for squares that can only be accessed by two other squares. There are eight such squares on this chessboard. I'll try to color code the paths to make it easier to see. By the exact same logic as the 3x6 case, if we were to have a closed tour of this chessboard, all 16 of these edges would have to be part of that closed tour. But since the dark red and the lighter red edges form a path, which I'll color in the lighter red, and the dark blue and the Carolina blue edges form a path, which I'll color in a regular blue, and the remaining colored edges each form their own path, we can think about our 16 edges as six paths that each would have to be part of any closed tour. These paths go through all the squares except for two, so all we'd have to do to create a closed tour is connect all the paths and make sure we go through those two squares. Trying to figure out how to do so, or more accurately proving that you can't, is a tall order, but maybe I can simplify things a little bit. Look what happens when we collapse all the paths down to individual squares. You're probably thinking, wow, that's a lot of animation. It must have taken you a long time. Yup. And also, how do collapsing these paths down to single squares help us answer the original question? Well, since we're interested in connecting the different paths to each other and the two squares that were not traversed by a path, in the collapse diagram, I'll add an edge any time a knight can get from one end of a path to the end of a different path in a single move. So for example, since a knight can get from the end of the pink path to the end of the orange path in a single move, I'll put an edge between the pink and orange squares. Similarly, a knight can get from the end of the green path to the end of the brown path, so I'll put an edge between those squares. A knight can also get from red to pink or blue to brown, so I'll add those edges. And finally, a knight can get between the ends of the orange and green paths, so I'll add that edge. We're not quite done because we still need to incorporate the purple and yellow squares in the middle of our board that have not yet been traversed by these paths. So let's see, I guess if a knight were on the yellow square, it could get to the end of the blue path or it could get to the end of the pink path. And if a knight were on the purple square, it could get to the end of the brown path or it could get to the end of the red path. At this point, maybe you're super impressed that we've managed to transform a super challenging problem about finding a closed tour on a three x eight chessboard into a fairly simple problem looking for a closed tour on these eight colored squares. Well, I got a confession to make. These two problems aren't the exact same. If we find a closed tour on the eight squares, there's no guarantee that it would lead to a closed tour on the three x eight chessboard. The problem is that our eight squares don't consider which end of the path it's gonna connect to. In order to create a closed path, the knight has to go in one end of the path and out the other end of the path. 
What I'm saying is even if we found a closed tor on the eight squares, it wouldn't necessarily give us a closed tor on the three by eight chessboard. However, if we could find a closed tor on the three by eight chessboard, it would definitely give us a closed tor on the eight squares. And you're like, right, but that doesn't really help us. Well, it kind of does because if we could show that no closed tor exists on the eight squares, then there certainly could not be a closed tor on the three by eight chessboard. So since I'm trying to show that there's no closed tor on the three by eight chessboard, all I gotta do is show that there's no closed tor on the eight squares. That's very doable. Consider the orange square. If there was a closed tor, I'd need a line going into it and a line coming out of it. So both of these edges would have to be part of the closed tor. Similarly, the red square needs a line in and a line out, and the yellow square needs a line in and a line out. But now we've got a problem. We've got three lines going to the pink square. That can't happen as part of a closed tor. So we have a contradiction. Can't possibly have a closed tour on the eight squares, so a closed tour on the three by eight chessboard is impossible. Some good news, a three by eight chessboard was the final chessboard that we needed to exclude to come up with our complete list of all the chessboards that a closed tour exists upon. Amazingly, any chessboard that doesn't fit one of the criteria listed in these five points has a closed tour. I won't take you through the entire proof, but I'll give you the idea of what our buddy AJ Schwenk lays out pretty clearly in an article in Math Magazine that you can read here if you want. What he did was studied knight's tours on chessboards where one of the dimensions was four. Not necessarily closed tours or open tours, just got really good with boards where either the length or the width is four. He got so good with them that he was able to take any board that a closed tour exists upon, and as long as that board contained 10 specific edges, he was able to extend that tour to a board whose length was four greater or to a board whose width was four greater. Here's a figure straight from his actual paper. Think of the little white circles as gold squares on our chessboard and the black circles as purple squares on our chessboard. Maybe we have a, I don't know, 100 by 100 chessboard for which we figured out a closed tour. If that tour contains these three edges down in the bottom left-hand corner, these three edges up in the top right-hand corner, and these four edges down in the bottom right-hand corner, we'll be able to extend that closed tour to a closed tour on a 104 by 100 chessboard or a 100 by 104 chessboard. It's probably easier seen with an example. Let's start out with this closed tour on a three by 10 chessboard. There's something oddly satisfying about watching these closed tours come to fruition. I don't know, maybe it's just me. Anyways, because this chessboard contains these special edges, Schwenk is able to extend this tour to a seven by 10 board or a three by 14 board because he figured out how to add four to either the length or the width. Let me demonstrate. Remember when I said our buddy Schwenk was really good with chess boards where one of the dimensions was four? Look at this three by four tour. And maybe you're like, wait a minute, there's something wrong. That's not a closed tour. That's an open tour. Right, Schwenk's good at all sorts of tours. And in this case, it's an open tour we want. Because look, if we put this tour side by side with our old closed tour, we can change this edge, which was guaranteed to be there because it's one of the special edges, into these two edges to create our three by 14 closed tour. And importantly, the extended tour would also contain these important edges. So we could add four to the length or width of this three by 14 board. And since Schwenk figured out a way to do so while preserving these 10 important edges, we could add four to the length or width of those resulting boards and still have a closed tour and so on and so on. So think about the infinitely many chess boards out there of different dimensions. We've shown that we can't have the length or width be equal to one, nor can we have the length or width equal to two, nor can we have a three by six or three by eight chessboard. We can't have the length or width be equal to four, and we can't have both the length and the width be odd numbers. That gets rid of a lot of cases, but there's still a lot left. But what the homie Schwenk did is give us a closed tour on a three by 10 chessboard that contains his special edges and show us how we can add four to the length or width of that chessboard or any chessboard that results from adding four to its length or width. That takes care of all these cases. Okay, we're getting closer, but there's still a lot of open squares. Well, I haven't shown you this yet, but Schwenk also showed us a closed tour on a 3x12 chessboard that contains all the necessary edges, allowing us to add four to its length or its width. And he didn't stop there. He showed us a 5x6, 6x6, and 7x6 chessboard, again, each containing the important edges, also a 5x8, 6x8, 7x8, and 8x8 chessboard, also containing those important edges. With these nine base cases, and the ability to add four to any of their lengths or widths and any of the resulting lengths or widths, we cover every single chessboard out there that we have not yet eliminated. That's pretty cool. This video got really long, so let me end it here. 
I owe you a solution to a problem from earlier in the video, so I'll let that roll while I ask you your challenge question for this week. I feel like there's tons of possibilities for what I could ask for this week's challenge question, but I was able to narrow it down to just two. What I thought would be cool to play with are knight's tours in three dimensions. So instead of looking for a closed tour on a rectangular chessboard in two dimensions, what about a closed tour on this two by two by two cube? Or a closed tour on this little torus looking thing that I made out of cubes? The rules are the same, visit every square exactly once and end up wherever you started, and you're only allowed to travel from square to square using the moves of a knight. A minor point, the moves of a knight are a little bit weird in three dimensions. Earlier in the video, I said a knight can move two squares horizontally and one vertically, or two vertically and one horizontally. For the purposes of three dimensions, a knight can move two in one direction and one in a perpendicular direction, or one in a direction and two in a perpendicular direction. The order ends up being important with three dimensions. So for example, if we had a knight up here on the face labeled A, it could move two squares towards us, so go from A to B over here to J, and then turn and move one square to our right to end up over here on M. However, from that same starting position of square A, if the knight moved one square to the right first, it would take it down here to N, and then if it turned and moved two squares, sort of to the front of our original perspective, it would traverse over M and end up here at J. The point is that starting at A, taking one step to the right and two steps forward leaves us at a different square than if we take two steps forward and then one to the right, informally speaking. I know it's a little bit hard to see the labels on the faces, but I tried to make them pretty intuitive. On the top here, we got A, B, C, and D as our faces. And then sort of directly front from that perspective, we have E, F, G, and H. And as we work our way around the outside, I, J, K, and L, M, N, O, and P, and Q, R, S, and T. And if we again align the top so that we have A, B, C, and D looking like this, then when we cycle down to the bottom, we see U, V, W, and X in maybe the spaces where you'd expect them. On the torus, the naming convention was a little bit harder, but I again tried to keep things as intuitive as possible. On the top here, we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. And if we sort of come down the front face, we see I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, and R, S, and T as we cycle around the outside. And then because I was running out of letters, what I did is the face opposite this A, I labeled with two A's. And the face opposite this D, I label with two D's, and so on. So on the other side of this G, we expect to see a double G, which sure enough we do. And that same convention holds for the inside of the torus. So you see an S here, the opposite side of this cube is this double S, and the opposite side of this M right here is that hard to see double M. Anyway, see if you can come up with any closed tours. And if not, see if you can prove why one can't exist. As always, I'll look for thoughts, questions, and solutions in the comments.